اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين امين yesterday we talked about uh, the two types of of becoming hypocrite or two types of hypocrites or the one who lights his own fire creates his own way of life and the other one who cherry picks in the Quran and ends up not finding any guidance at all uh, remember that both of them are types of kafirs they are both types of uh, disbelievers so do not be misled by the, the, the term hypocrite a hypocrite is simply a disbeliever who is um, either pretending to be a Muslim or um, acting uh, from his point of view sincerely as a Muslim but practically really not following Islam because when you cherry pick you don't you don't follow Islam the Quran is a package deal you either take it all or you I know we have to go gradually but whatever you read as a new Muslim whatever you read of it um, you need to follow it you can take time uh, to do it but you can't um, say uh, uh, okay I'll do the pork I'll do the wine but this here um, no there is no there is no such Islam you know, whatever you read you follow and you say I hear and obey and so what happens if you don't is that Allah will uh, block off um, your uh, your heart uh, will block off your eye, uh, your your hearing and there will be a veil uh, on on your eyesight so that you just like the hypocrite you sometimes see sometimes don't and your vision is not clear um, so definitely uh, the Quran is clear about it right from the very beginning a hypocrite is a kind of kafir a kind of disbeliever the munafiq is a disbeliever um, and there is mention in the um, story of the, the hypocrites that they um, they have secret leaders called sh shaitan or shayateen when we say a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim the word shaitan doesn't mean one person it's it's all of them their father Iblis and all his children uh, boys and girls who have decided to um, play that role that their father played which is be a rebel a supporter of rebel just like there are angels who help us without us seeing them and give us good ideas and good energy um, I don't know whether <laughs> shaitans can uh, can give us good energy but they sh certainly give us bad idea I mean uh, bad energy but they give us bad ideas for sure and um, but so uh, so that we don't get spooked by the the idea of, of shaitan and so that we don't think that it's poltergeist uh, uh, shaitan that will shake up the house and shake us and you really have to go seek out the shaitan in order to have the shaitan have that much influence on you but there is a prayer that all Muslims are supposed to say and it's a hadith uh, and it says Allahumma inni a'udhu bika ni tahabbatani shaitan in the mouth Oh Allah I seek refuge with you that I, I don't get shaken up by shaitan when I'm dying because when we're weak especially when we're weak minded uh, shaitan can exploit it on the other hand if we are insane or we, we lost uh, we are brain damaged Allah will protect us from shaitan um, the word majnoon uh, in Arabic means uh, someone who is with jinn but jinn will only uh, play with the mind and, and the behavior of a person who turns away from Allah and how do I, how do I know that uh, in Surah 43 we have uh, these two verses that define uh, uh, what shaitan does and when shaitan has power 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ومن يعش عن ذكر الرحمن نقيد له شيطانا فهو له قرين وإنهم لا يصدونهم عن السبيل ويحسبون أنهم مهتدون This is Az-Zukhruf 43, Surah 43, verses 36 and 37. Whoever um, pretends to be blind or doesn't look uh, sincerely and, and, and uh, seriously at uh, Dhikr al-Rahman is the Qur'an. A dhikr is the Qur'an. Dhikr al-Rahman is the dhikr of Allah, which is the Qur'an. And dhikr means the book to study and follow and think about all the time. Dhikr doesn't just mean remember or mention or, or say. Dhikr means think and study and research and apply uh, and take a lesson. So one of the most famous names of the Quran is a dhikr, which is the book to really learn from and follow. The textbook, our textbook. So whoever um, acts like blind doesn't look seriously at the textbook of Ar-Rahman. We shall prepare for him. We shall make available for him cause uh, shaitan to become his constant mate. A Karin is a constant mate. They're, they're always together, a body. And what those mates do is they push the person or the persons here, at the verse 37 says, push the persons away from the path, from the path of the Quran, but they think that they are rightly guided. So this is uh, the main thing that shaitan does. And shaitan only comes if we reject the Quran in one form or another. This is what these two verses tell us. If we reject the Quran, if we don't take it seriously, if we cherry pick um, whatever we do with the Quran that is uh, similar to Yasha, which means Asha uh, uh, is someone who doesn't see well in the dark. And so um, we cannot pretend or act as if we don't see well. When we read the Quran, we, 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 we have to open our eyes and read it seriously. Allah has chosen this. Um, this verb, this word that expresses uh, not seeing well in the dark to, to uh, impress upon us that um, we really need to look and understand and live it. Not all at once, but in pieces. Uh, without making plans from the very beginning that, well, okay, I will do Islam, but those parts I'm not going to do. Um, because a lot of things we already know as we approach Islam and, and even old Muslims, um, Muslims who grew up with Islam, they've, they've already, um, some of them have figured out that certain things they will not do. So that's not gradual, that is deliberate. What is, um, what is Sunnah? Sunnah is the, what the Prophet did to implement the Quran. Imam W.D. Muhammad, rahimahullah, he demonstrated for us the Sunnah by looking at the Qur'an and looking at the um, life in America, especially the life of the African-American community, and interpreting the Qur'an using the Qur'an itself. And that's how the Qur'an is, is supposed to be used. It comes with a built-in dictionary and a built-in ability to translate and interpret. And so he demonstrated sunnah to us by reading the Qur'an and applying it. The purpose of the hadith is not to take it as a second source, which is what most Muslims do. In fact, some Muslims take the hadith and make it the first source. Uh, the hadith is all based on Qur'an. And the purpose of the hadith, as the Qur'an itself says, and I can discuss that on, in a different session, the purpose of the hadith is to explain how to implement the Qur'an. And so the purpose of uh, W.D. Imams, rahimahullah, W.D. Muhammad, uh, is to do it again, 
to try to do again what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, to, to see how, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam implemented the Qur'an, or to follow in his footsteps by reading the Qur'an and using the Hadith as, as um, a guide. And sometimes we don't find the Hadith. And the Prophet warned us about that, that sometimes we just have to use our own um, due diligence, our own mind. And so every Muslim, every Muslim is supposed to follow Qur'an and Sunnah, meaning he's supposed to read the Qur'an and try to understand. And the Qur'an has many, many basic principles that are explained and stated in the simplest ways that um, any human being can understand and apply. The early Muslims, they were not intellectuals. They were, they, most of them were um, ummiyin, they were illiterate. So anyway, uh, that is important to, to look at the Qur'an that way, that it is for us to read and think about and apply. And that is what sunnah means. It doesn't mean to go look what someone else has done in research and say, I don't have to think. And that's not acceptable. The Qur'an says you are responsible with all your senses and your mind. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to revisit another subject and talk about this, the um, the principle of of precedence and priorities. It's these are big words, but what it means is is that Allah has taught us in the Quran that some things are more important than others. Um, in general, spiritual matters are more important than body matters, and body matters in turn are more important than money matters. These are the sequences that uh, the scholars have uh, found in the Qur'an. Uh, the goals of Sharia, the goals of the Qur'an, is to protect and preserve and maintain and build up the interests of the spirit and the interests of the body and the interests of property and wealth. In that sequence, you can never put... Um, body above soul's interests. You can never put business above body's or, or life's interests. You can't destroy um, a neighborhood um, in order to make room for business. You can't um, sacrifice your soul for your family, although your family is part of your life. So there are these priorities, and the priorities are laid out in the Quran. And, and here's an example, um, as Allah in Surah 7, uh, verses 189 and 190, Surah 7, one, verses 189 and 190, defines marriage to us. He is um, also uh, setting priorities. The sequence of things in the Quran sets the priorities. He is the one who has created you all from one soul. So he didn't say one body. He created us all from one soul. And, and so the body serves the soul and not the other way around. When we pray, we're using our body to serve our soul. We're bending in order to teach our soul humility, right? We're bending and prostrating with our body to teach our soul, our spirit, humility. He's the one who created you all from one soul. And from it, he created. Now, the word zawjaha means her spouse. Uh, but what it actually means is his wife. And we know the Prophet wasallam explained that to us and said uh, Eve was created, Hawa uh, was created from Adam's rib. Now, uh, because the Quran says it's, uh, a soul was created from a soul, the rib must be a symbol of, of the spiritual part of Adam. Um, now, how do I know that that hadith is, is correct? And yes, we have to check hadith based on the Quran. The continuation of this ayah says, لِيَسْكُنَ ilayha," So that he resides with her. There are no two meanings for this phrase. He, the man, resides with her, with the woman. So he created the woman from the man's soul 
so that the man resides with his wife. Now this uh, puts a, a heavy load on both of them. First of all, he says he created, so the purpose of the creation is to have that residence together. And this makes the husband the highest priority for the woman. Not the children, the husband is the highest priority. And Hadith explains that to us. There is a Hadith that says if, um, if a woman prays her five and, and fasts her month and um, uh, offers her zakat and, and obeys her husband, then she can enter paradise into whatever door she chooses and whatever gate she chooses. Now, why would Allah make um, the relationship between the wife and her husband, why would he make that like a, um, a sixth pillar of Islam? And, and the same thing for men. It is because the purpose of creation is to have that community which starts with the, with the marriage. Community starts with the wife and husband. And the husband, in turn, is told and warned in the same way that Allah warns the, the disbelievers that he will burn in the hell that burns stones if he does not act as a, as a proper husband and, and really insist that his wife um, follow the path to Jannah. Uh, we have talked about that uh, in the lecture. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, it's 66. Surah 66, verse 6, um, 6, 6, verse 6. And uh, that's, that's the men's, that's the men's, uh, that's the men's uh, hot call. Now, the woman's hot call is 34, verse, uh, th verse uh, Surah 4, verse 34. And that is to be really obedient and cooperating with her husband from the bottom of her soul. Now, who does that? That is a hot call. That's for sure in this age a hot call. And it was a hot call at the time of the Prophet. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, he did this most important thing, which is to have a wife. He did it so many times because he has to be our example. And he did it with any woman Allah told him to do it with. He said, you marry this woman, you marry this woman. These are, um, and the sisters probably studied that, and, and the brothers should study this too. What kinds of women has the prophet married? All kinds of women. And with, he did not marry them because he, uh, he craved them or he, need, he needed the, the, the sexual uh, needs. Well, everybody, every man has that need. And, but he married them because Allah prescribed it to him, and that's how prophets act. They don't act of, of their own. They do what Allah tells them to do. And, and so at one time, he had to marry the ex-wife of his adoptive son in order to make a case that um, when you say, this is my son, doesn't make him your son. Only Allah decides who's, who's your son. That's what Surah 33 explains very clearly. And so after the, the, the adoptive son, divorced uh, the wife, the prophet was ordered to marry her for that purpose only. So the, the prophet married to fulfill spiritual religious purposes. And uh, the, the highest purpose, of course, is to, to build community. And what is the purpose of community? The purpose of community is to test us. So it's not to, to have fun and comfort and so on. It's a constant challenge where life here is a challenge and a test. And then Allah warns us, when he entered her, she first uh, carried a light load, and she passed. And then when she became heavy, they both prayed to their Lord, if you give us a righteous child, we shall be certainly grateful. But when, when he did give them a righteous child, they made for him associates in what he has given them. Now, what does that mean? Both the husband, and in Arabic, there is a dual form. So the husband and the wife, they both associated partners with Allah in the child, in the way they treated the child. This is open to whatever interpretation you can find. For example, after they get the child, they say, 
they might say, okay, I know that usury is haram, but I'm going to go to the bank and borrow because my child needs this and my child needs this. That is putting an associate next to Allah. They promised to worship Allah sincerely, but when the child was there, they compromised the Quran. If uh, the wife says uh, after, the hus after the child is born, okay, now you are um, you're secondary. Um, you know, my focus is my children here. And you know I'm a mother, and you come next. Well, Allah did not say that. Allah said husband comes next. Why? Because he's the head of the household, and he would, uh, he would be tempted to do haram if his wife does not respond to his needs. And, uh, and so she cannot set up an associate, which is her own opinion and her own ego, next to Allah after she has a baby and turn to her husband and say, okay, I will come to you whenever I want, not whatever you need me. That is setting up an associate. And so uh, I think that's enough for today. I, I have shocked you enough and challenged you enough. Um, there, is a, there is a lot more to say, but um, um, I, we talked about what shaitan is and how shaitan is empowered and about the priorities and about the meaning of sunnah. And um, um, there is a final verse in Surah um, An-Nur, which is, I think it's 20, 24, is it 24? The Light, the Surah is called The Light. This is verse 32, and it says, Marry, give spouses to everyone who is not married, whether it's a, a virgin, a divorced man or woman, and those who are righteous of your uh, slave, uh, slave men and slave women. If they are poor, Allah will give them enough of his bounty. So poverty is no handicap, and it's incumbent upon the community to, find, to, to, to make sure that everyone gets married. This is, um, this is a, a big challenge, uh, but Allah says at the end, Allah is vast, vast in his bounty. So don't be concerned about how Allah will take care of all those marriages. Allah is vast, and Allah is knowing. That means Allah, Allah knows that um, those marriages will have their challenges, but Allah has, has guaranteed in, uh, in verse, um, Surah 30, verse 21, that he will create the love and the mercy between the two if, if they keep their promise with Allah, if they put Allah first and, and follow the Quran, then Allah will keep giving them that mercy and that compassion. And compassion is important, and Allah gives it because the wife for the husband is the biggest challenge he can face. In fact, there's a verse that says, some of your wives and children are your enemies. And um, so that's how much the challenge can be. And for the woman, the biggest challenge, her jihad, is to be a good wife. And the prophet told the women when they asked him about jihad, he said, it's being a good wife, and few of you make it. Few of you are good wives. Um, but if you are a good wife, then you are a martyr. Your level is the same level as a martyr who, who dies while fighting for Allah or defending his family or whatever martyrs may be. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafi mursaleen al-fatiha bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen al-Rahman rahim Malik yawm al-Din Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم Then, then she, uh, if the husband is 